Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blayton. This is Patch In, the monthly show from SoundNotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. Starting off with some news and product information, uh, for everyone out there with an iPad, AudioBus 2 is out. If you have AudioBus version 1, it's a free update. It allows you now to do a lot more stuff with routing, including going through multiple effects from instrument to output. Um, also, there's some add-ons so that you can do uh, multiple streams with multiple effects simultaneously, and it's absolutely worth upgrading if you haven't done it already. Uh, there were some issues with the upgrades initially, but they fixed it. It's smooth. It's awesome. Get it. And speaking of multiple effects simultaneously, the new uh, Bitwig Studio is finally out. Um, we've got it. It's for Windows, Mac, OS X, or OS X, and Linux, and it's a... From what I understand, it looks like it's going to be a pretty good Ableton Live alternative for doing live production or any kind of music. And so that's, that's going to be something good. If you've got the 400 bucks to shell out for it, check it out. But additionally, speaking of Ableton Live, uh, the Ableton 9.1.2 maintenance update is out. So all of you that are, had some little bugs, check this out. This might fix your problem. Yeah, the Ableton upgrade just came out today. Uh, as did the update for Reason 7.1, which is a huge rewrite of the uh, Rack Extension SDK. Uh, it's got a lot of improvements. There's a new version of that out. But it also comes with a couple of other fun little things. Uh, for current Reason 7 users, users and new users, until June 30th, you can download the Synchronous Timed Effects Modulator Rack Extension for free. Um, I've played around with it a little bit. It's pretty cool. It allows you to create different uh, synchronous uh, waveforms that you can use as LFOs to drive the built-in effects on it or to just go CV out into your other Reason devices and use those. Highly recommend it, especially because it's free until June 30th, and then the price will bump up to whatever they decide to set it at. Mm-hmm. And I'm uh, sorry for, to bring this conversation down a little bit, but we've lost a good one for electronic music. Frankie Knuckles, or Francis Nichols, as his, as his original name is, uh, passed away March 31st, 2014. He's uh, known for all of his contributions to electronic music, and some people would call him the godfather of house. Check out his stuff, and uh, yeah, it's a wonderful person. So in the wonderful world of Kickstarter, there is, of course, a uh, product that... I absolutely want to have, but uh, if I get it, we'll probably spend way too much time and neglect doing the podcast. I am, of course, talking about the new uh, Theremin Auto Harp Hybrid, the Air Harp. It's a digital ultrasonic auto harp. It has MIDI out. You press buttons just like an, an auto harp, and it plays chords or single note MIDI. It looks really awesome. They have 15 days to go to reach a $10,000 goal, and they're about 8K short. And speaking of Kickstarters, if you remember our guest two months ago, Chester Udell, or Chet Udell as we like to call him in our familiar circles, his immersion gesture control system for music and performance and more, his Kickstarter for this, they're just $250 away from their $7,500 goal. There's 10 days to go, so there's still, you can still get... <laughs> get your $50 pledge for uh, the software or any of the different uh, redeemable things that they have. Um, they check it out. It's a, it's a wonderful platform that, they, that he'll be developing. And uh, yeah, check out his Kickstarter. We'll have the links in the notes. And last but not least, uh, of course, last week we had April Fool's Day. And, of course, the Internet exploded with fake products. And Sweetwater sound of course had to come up with something as well uh if you didn't see it they revealed the best guitar pick of all time Holy cow. it's a next generation pick that allows you to use usb based high definition modeling to open up new tonal vistas and model the shape and hardness of whatever pick you want uh, go to Sweetwater's site and take a look at it. It is something that if someone wants to 3D print and send me a copy of, I will happily uh, show on the next episode. There it is. What a wonderful device. And you can just see, like, the utility with, of, of such a pick. Like, you, <laughs> you kind of have to, like, hold it around the edges to get around the USB drive and everything. But, you know, it's 
s- small change for the the benefits of the HD modeling. It's really really a wonderful product. Yeah, my students would love to have one of these, and I would love to see them use one. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, so that that wraps up our introduction bit of news. Uh, but we've got a wonderful guest today. His name is Ben Grosser. Um, I actually. Thanks uh, so much for joining us on the show, man. Yeah, happy to be here. So uh, our producer, David McDonald, turned us on to you and your stuff. He saw a piece of yours over at the NASA conference uh, just a couple weeks ago. Can you tell us a little bit about this piece? Sure. So um, it's titled More Like This, um, and it's a piece for two saxophonists, artificial intelligence, uh, and participatory audience essentially. Um, and, you know, just to give the briefest just kind of description, we can get into the details. You've got two saxophonists, um, Rhonda Taylor and Michael Ibrahim, mm-hmm. on stage, and they are playing anywhere between one and two saxophones at once. <laughs> There's a, an artificial intelligence system I've, I've written and I'm using to give instructions to them as to what they're going to play next. While, it, while they play that, the system listens to how they play it and uses that as information, um, essentially considers what it hears as input into its decision-making process for the next segment it's going to play, They're, you know, it's going to ask them to play. And then on top of all that, the system is taking sound out to accompany them and also listening to the audience give its input. And so, yeah, I can see you guys have got this on the screen. Everybody has on their, on their phone or iPad or computer the ability to go to a website, and they can up or down vote what they're hearing in real time, and there's a cumulative um, count of everybody in the room being shown above the performers there on the screen. And so whatever that number is is being considered by the system. It's, it's not driving it, and that's an important kind of piece of this. It's just mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's part of the decision-making process. It's interesting. So, And uh, it's pretty neat. You, you talk about the computer as, as it's making these choices and considering the different elements that it has to work with. Um, how, like, so I, listening on your, through your back catalog of music, I, I understand you're quite a composer and it's wonderful to hear your, uh, everything that you do. Um, I've seen a good chunk of your art on, on the website as well. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as we go, but I'm really impressed with your, <laughs> your computer programming and, uh, how, how do you get into dealing with artificial intelligence? Yeah. Um, my initial, you know, the, the way I got into programming seriously and originally was to do computer music. Yeah. So back when I got my start, um, writing code was really the only way to do it. Okay. There wasn't Max MSP or anything like that around. In fact, computers didn't, so give away my age a little bit, but computers didn't come with sound cards. Right. Um, so you had to go to the university lab to, you know, like use their D to A converters um, to get any sound out and... Uh, and just in the process, once I got into graduate school, I started trying to find ways to um, create software that would generate new timbres. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's usually, um, you guys are familiar with this too, there's kind of the computer music people who are really trying to make things that sound like things you've already heard. Right. Like, I have any number of students who do that. <laughs> yes. I, I fail to understand why anybody cares. But, right. <laughs> um, and then there's the people who want to make something that, you know, you haven't heard, and that, that's who I was, and that's who I still am. And so um, as part of that process, I was looking around, and um, genetic algorithms caught my attention for some reason or another at the time. Yeah, your work with the genetic algorithms and composition and sound synthesis uh, examples on your website for our listeners are really, really interesting, um, especially with the uh, thing that you pointed out that it's not a MIDI synthesizer. You're using it to create sounds that you describe as being both pretty or ugly, but nothing like a traditional instrument. That's, that's definitely the intent, um, and, I, and I appreciate it. I, you know, one of the things, we, we could go off in this direction any number of ways, but I'll mm-hmm. just throw it out, is you know, one of the things that I think maybe is harder to have happen, because I teach students how to mess with sound these days, is... When you aren't getting down to the level and kind of playing with things, learning what a sample is and how to 
you know, make something happen just by writing a stream of numbers, which is essentially what making sound is at, at the lowest level, um, it, you end up inheriting certain kinds of sound uh, qualities or aesthetics that come with these packages. Mm-hmm. You know, they, 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 they bring with them a certain kind of refinement or a certain aesthetic, and they lead you to develop sound in certain ways. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just if you aren't aware of it and thinking about it, then you get sounds that sound like they came from certain kinds of programs. Well, like now to uh, follow up on that, do you think yeah. that it's um, – necessarily the software or maybe mental conditioning. Um, I mean, I just got back from SCI and I heard a lot of computer music pieces that had woodblock type sounds and metallic type sounds and wind type sounds. And you see the same thing at Seamus and at EMM and any other conference you want to name. So is it necessarily the software or is it our conditioning that's driving those choices? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm glad you're getting into it deeper. The, I would argue it's both. From the software side of things, um, you know, all this software is designed by somebody. Right. And, uh, and it's developed over the years by a small set of people. Those people come from a certain kind of cultural position. They have you know, ideas about what they think music should sound like, how you should construct it, what it should do. Um, and so you end up with software, let's face it, uh, this is not a bad thing, but that makes it easy for them to make the music they want to make. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, you have to go to extra effort at a software level to get music that isn't what they would want to make. And, you know, or doesn't come with some of those inherent biases already wrapped into the code. At the same time, obviously, um, these packages make it easy to produce woodblock sounds and wind sounds and whatnot, and we already hear that in all these conferences and in other, you know, other spaces, and I think as humans, we, especially when you're trying to make music, one of the first ways you start by doing it is trying to make music that sounds like music, mm-hmm. and your right. idea of what music is is what you've already heard, so um, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's kind of like a hard thing to get away from, always trying to make things that sound nice and pretty like we've been hearing in other spaces right and and we as uh composers get to try to invent something new and and maybe that's doing something with the language that other people have built and trying to twist it in a new way or do something or like perhaps like completely come up with a whole new sonic landscape and and generate your own audio from (laughs) from samples and bits and draw your waves and everything um, right. I, 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 I was going through, uh, some of your pieces were, were pretty interesting to me. Um, and this kind of ties in with some of the, one of the things that I do with my audio students, my student workers is like, I always make sure that when we're using our older audio interfaces that they don't like set their cell phone down on top of it or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I seem like to remember someone, a couple of concerts where that happened. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and so you you know what I'm talking about. I, I, I um, I'm leading up to this piece, <laughs> Interfrared, and, and maybe I'm saying that right. But um, the the sonic landscape of that, to me, seems driven from the product of having a cell phone and some faulty wiring and like getting or like on a guitar amp or something where it's picking up. Uh, that that right. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, I mean, you got a great ear. It's, it's exactly. I mean, it's just a recorded um, holding a cell phone up to a speaker. Yeah, and waiting for you know it to contact the tower and, and generate that that buzz clicking sound. So I just captured that, and then I made the whole piece out of it. That's wonderful. What what made you think to do that, Link? Um, I think yeah. I mean, honestly, I think it's just going through the motions of sometimes being extremely annoyed by this sound getting produced when I don't want to hear it um, right. and trying to find a way to like it and not okay. always be annoyed by it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> if I may jump in here a little bit, I don't normally yes. in- inject myself into the, into the conversation, but I happen to, to be at the conferences as Nate mentioned yeah. and, and hear more like this and hearing you describe 
what you did to capture that interference sound um, and how you, you talked about more like this, it seems like you are doing things that are removing a certain amount of control from yourself. You talk about, you know, holding the phone up to the speaker and just waiting for it to happen and the sound that it makes is the sound that it makes. And when, <laughs> and when you, when you talked to, um, or when you talked about more like this, you not only created this algorithm that is thinking on its own a little bit about what should come next in the piece, uh, but you, you've also given a, a, an even more organic sense of, of control to the audience and to the performers. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering uh, how you feel about uh, using something that seems so exacting and precise as writing code to generate something that is uh, relatively unpredictable and uh, organic? Yeah, that's a great question and good set of observations. I mean, I guess for me, the the word I'd, I'd want to talk about is agency. And I'm interested in to what degree do I have control over these systems when I'm building them? Um, what degree does the system have control over how I build them um, or impose some kinds of, of suggestions or controls over how I build them? And then in the case of performance works, um, you know, what, what control does a performer have or what control does an audience have? And in, in this, in, you know, I, in, you could consider a lot of these just uh, these different pieces as experiments to play with different configurations and try and examine, you know, okay, if I put more control into the hands of the audience, but also have the performers have control in certain ways, you know, what is that mix, and who is in control in these spaces? And I mean, for me, yeah, code is this space where you can definitely produce something in a very precise manner. It's often used to do that. Um, but I think it's uh, maybe misleading to presume or imagine that code's output is, is always so uh, exacting. Um, all you have to do is think about the ways in which software doesn't do what you wanted it to do or doesn't work the way you thought it should to yeah. realize that something else is also going on here that... Yeah. That yeah. you know, for me, it makes me imagine and and presume some amount of agency on the part of the software itself. Well, I guess mm -hmm. in that in that sense, it is there is a certain amount of of, uh, of feedback that you're getting that you're putting into the machine and getting stuff back out. There's uh, or I didn't mean feedback, I meant input. You're, you're yeah. putting input in and getting something out, and you have a marginal amount of control over the process that that turns the input into the output. Um, but like you said, a lot of times it is unexpected. And it, you, you mentioned that the, the things that are coming out from the saxophonist are kind of fed back into the system. That's what I meant to say. Um, that you're getting this, this feedback in, the, in from the saxophonist. And, and in some regards, that's when you, when you said that, it made me think of the, uh, this. Uh, I, I just recently was going through uh, Michio Kaku's latest book, where he's talking about how the brain works and, and comparing the ways the brain works to the ways computers work. And one of the things that we're just figuring out about the brain and trying to emulate in computer neural networks is that feedback part, where it's always kind of recalculating its own interpretation based on new information and, and kind of refactoring everything continuously. And so that struck me as a as a even even more organic way to think about more like this. Even with the the audience input, you have this sense of the the performers reinterpreting or the computer reinterpreting the things that it's already done. Um, so definitely, yeah. do you, is that are you, are you thinking about what you're making with a computer in terms of um, it, you know uh, life? And, and kind of biological things when you when you do things like that. Yes. No is okay. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess the way I do I do refer to some of these systems as um, having the ability to consider or um, making choices. Um, I think that it is useful to articulate 
what they're doing in these terms because they're terms that are easy for us to um, apply uh, our own considerations to. But, I mean, are they alive? Yes and no. I mean, you know, it's like I'm not focused on trying to build artificial life, Mm -hmm. but I'm interested in what happens when I – yeah, I think, as you put it, you know, earlier is to kind of let some of the control go over to the system itself, which means it has some control. So, in you know, in some sense, yeah, it's 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 doing things on its own. Mm-hmm. Now, in giving the system control, you're always introducing the possibility that the system will make bad choices mm-hmm. in a piece. Have yeah. you had that happen? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all the time. Um, I yeah. mean, sometimes those are the best ones to ever happen. You know, if they're bad, what's bad? I mean, in some cases you could define bad as uh, meaning I didn't expect it. Could be in a good way or in a bad way or an undesired way. Right. Um, but, you know, a couple ways I'd think about that. One is that the undesired or the unexpected maybe means I just don't know how to appreciate it yet. And I'm going to get there. And without the system doing it for me, I wouldn't have ever known. Mm -hmm. Um, the other though, I mean, you know, just for example, more like this, um, could easily have taken 30 minutes. Like I can't, I can make, and I, and I've set it up so I can make conditions so that there's a high likelihood the piece is going to go about the length that I expect. But it could have gone longer. And of course we were in a situation where we're told you got to be done in 20 minutes. And, yeah. uh, you know, so there, there, there is the potential for things to go wrong. And I don't know if you um, got to look at the robotic painting machine. Yeah. I did. Work of mine, but there's, there's a lot of parallels. And in, in, in fact, in software between more like this and that piece and in the robotic painting machine piece, um, you know, one of the things I found is that if I, uh, critique it. So I used to, you know, I, I, we haven't really talked about it. Maybe I'll just introduce it super briefly, but I think it's relevant yeah, to the yeah. question, Absolutely. which is that, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a physical machine that uses a, you know, manipulates a brush, dips it into paint and then paints on canvas. Um, and while it does so, it listens to its environment and uses that as input into the painting process. But without any painting at all, it's still going, without any sound at all, it's still going to make a painting. Um, and one of the things I tried with that machine is to tell it what I thought about what it was painting while it was doing the painting. In other words, if it made a mark I didn't like, I'd tell it so. If it made something <laughs> I liked, I would say, oh, that's good. You should do more of that. And... Um, you know, kind of thinking about it in a critique sense, right? It's like the, you know, you go to art school, you go, you, you're subject to critique when you put your work up. I was trying to critique it in real time, and yeah. one thing I found is that the more I critiqued it, the the more I hated its output. Interesting. <laughs> in other words, you know, it, I, I could try and analyze and figure out in the system exactly why that would happen. I'm not sure I care to, but mm-hmm. um, you know, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So the more so that's an interesting kind of. Sorry, I'm not trying to <laughs> trying to not play the audio. There we go. <laughs> Got it. You were saying. Uh, no. yeah. Well, it's it's an interesting thing to me. So like that uh, that level of uh, input in into the robot and the feed that, that it gets feedback on what it's doing, such that like. I love the context where you might actually say, like, no, bad robot. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is, this is, <laughs> but it's interesting that, uh, like, maybe the surprises in, like, I mean, you, you wrote all the code. You determined how it determines what it mm-hmm. would do, like the, the paths that it might take from the brush from point A to point B, how it generates that and everything. And, like, I can see how the surprises therein would be really interesting um and and in, in audio land like the the different like the small times that i've dove into artificial intelligence making these different little environments in pure data and stuff um it was really awesome being surprised like not really knowing how it made that sound and then like having to think about <laughs> how it got that from from what i put in um and so, like, I don't know, I like to think of these uh, 
these coding projects is kind of like a, an extension like of the self more than a, a, another piece of life or anything like this. I don't mean to get too medical, metaphysical. Yeah, it's, I don't mind going that direction. I, I think it's a reasonable way to think about it. Um, yeah. You know, when I, one question I get with the robotic painting machine, and I'm mm -hmm. sure I could get it with more like this as well, is what is the work? Where is the artist? Yeah. Um, you know, is it, are the paintings the work? Is the robot the work? Is the code the work? You know, it's like, you know, what is the art, essentially? Right. And, yeah. you know, really it's all. I mean, it's all the art. And the performance of the thing doing it. Yeah, sure. Right. Exactly. Like, I, I was just typing in chat that I could watch this thing do whatever it's doing all day. <laughs> this is really interesting. <laughs> right. exactly. now, that does bring up one interesting question, though, um, which is that the robotic painter does create a painting you can experience the totality of what it's done just by looking at it. Whereas with music, you have to approach it in the time domain and listen to it from the start through however long it takes. So do you see that as being an advantage or a disadvantage in the case of both the painter or in music? Yeah, it's a complicated question. I think you know, if to step back away from the kind of the artificial intelligence production of both of those, if we think about um, what's the difference between a painting and a, and a piece of music, whether no matter who created it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and what is the benefit or drawback of a temporal medium versus uh, an object that right. is relatively static over time. And, um, you know, they have their advantages and drawbacks. I mean, the ability to have temporal change, time over, you know, change over time produces a lot of different opportunities. Um, and it, at the same time, of course, introduces constraints. I think, I mean, it's interesting. Some people, and I've, I've had the paintings from the machine have been on exhibit on their own. I had somebody want them for an exhibit of, interestingly enough, paintings made by robots. <laughs> um, so it was in a show all about that. For me, it's an, like I would prefer them really not to exist completely on their own. Um, in fact, uh, uh, somebody, I, an artist I really respect, took a look at them once and um, declared them as competent hotel art, <laughs> uh, which I thought was a great compliment, honestly. Uh, nice. that, <laughs> that this robot could make competent hotel art is, is pretty good. <laughs> Yeah. Have you seen Untitled? Yes. The, the movie, yeah. <laughs> yes. Love it. 2009 yeah. Untitled, I believe. I mean, it's, yeah. that's a, that movie's a great like blend of the new music and the art worlds that you almost oh, yeah. never see. Yeah. Um, like, who, there must have been one person who's been in both worlds writing that film or two people mm -hmm. you know, who've been in each. I don't know. It's, anyway. Yeah. It's uh, Lost the in The hotel art thing reminded me of it. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean, so actually this leads me to a question like I uh, I I was really hoping to be able to hear some of this piece that I that you presented yes. at NASA and everything. Um but I wonder if releasing a recording of it, like how what are your what are your feelings on that? Cuz if it's so different every time, like how how do you record it? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I would prefer that it be released, uh, first of all, on video as opposed mm -hmm. to just uh, audio. Um, Rhonda, the performer, we did, I didn't get great documentation of the piece this time because I was coding right up until the moment that we performed it almost. But, yeah. And I'll, and I'll get it next time and we could talk about that too. But um, sure. the, I'm, I'm happy for somebody to, to be able to witness uh, a performance on video um as long as they you know it's it's made clear that this is one iteration of a work that would be different every time um and that is dependent on a very specific set of circumstances meaning you know the audience for example yeah. and, and what the audience finds interesting and, and what it does um yeah so uh i mean you you have a lot of music that is not that way, where there is like 
an audio file that would be a good representation of what you had in mind for the composition. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you like? Uh, do you do you still do work on uh, things like that, or are you on a? <laughs> it seems like you're on an artificial intelligence kick the last couple of years and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, my musical output is now um, only one component of what I make. So yeah, well, I make right. a lot of you know yeah. a lot of things that don't have any musical component at all. Um, I think what's happened in terms of my composition practice is that it's just become integrated as a part of my larger kind of just whatever it is I'm making. So yeah. sometimes a work requires music or, or sound or composition, um, but now you know sometimes it doesn't. And so uh, I happen to be interested in artificial intelligence and. Uh, quantification right now mm -hmm. is, is another topic of interest and so I think when I go to make a piece that includes music it includes those topics as well nice yeah and uh, we, I mean you as, as you say you, music is just a part of your output we've, we've seen some of <laughs> some of your painting through a robot and, right. um, and I've, I've seen some of your other visual art um, either software or oil on canvas you, you've got an interesting port uh self-portrait i believe um yeah. that is uh and it's paint on canvas looking at it it's, just like from far away it looks like pixels and that's an interesting thing to me too where it's uh coming from the do digital realm but then put out into or executed through such analog means and everything um i was wondering if i uh, like do you ever address that in music as well? Where like um, I've seen some some people do projects where they uh, have like a piece of software that generates all the notes that they would then write on paper and have an acoustic ensemble yeah. play, and uh, the the different play back and forth between those uh, analog and digital and computer generated and like mechanical kind of works. It's a it's a really interesting thing to me. Um, so I don't know this this self portrait just kind of struck me in that way. That it was addressing that that kind of crossover in a way I hadn't seen before. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess I mean certainly in some cases. I mean I've done computer work with computer assisted composition mm -hmm. uh, over at, at certain points over the years where software is really focused more in writing notes or generating material that turns into notes on paper that gets played by a performer. Right. Um, and so in that sense, it's kind of like going in and out of or back and forth through analog worlds. I think, you know, analog to digital, I think there's certainly interesting um, work that, that people are doing, looking at kind of what happens when, when things move back and forth and what are the, you know, how do, how do errors accumulate or how do um, transformations, you know, accumulate over time to, to change something into something else. Mm -hmm. um, with that particular, with that self-portrait you're referring to, um, I mean, what's funny for me is that's the last painting I made, and it was years ago at this point, made by hand, um, yeah. by hand anyway, um, <laughs> because it was so slow. <laughs> and of course, yeah. a lot of people look at the way I code and uh, using that to generate work and will say, well, that's so slow. It's so intense. You know, it's so labor intensive. Yeah. Uh, but it's labor intensive in a different way for me. I, you know, it doesn't feel like painting. I think it's because when, you, when I painted that painting, I knew roughly what the next thing was going to be all the time because yeah. it was kind of following a formula mm -hmm. so there's a I digital mean, version of that self-portrait too on on the website yeah that's the that's the painting i think if you scroll up or down i don't know where it is you can see the digital that's an animated one in digital yeah, yeah. somewhere else is a is a and you scroll up a little bit there yeah probably all the way Oh, I guess I don't have it on that. If you go to my about page, nope. you can see it. But okay. well, you know, whatever. It's um, you know, you get this. You know, like so. In other words, <laughs> I find <laughs> end up going back to code on that same project. Yeah. Um, as much as I like the output of the painting itself. I mean, it, and yeah. like with those ideas of, or with the idea of pixels and um, you or yeah, pixel generated kind of art and everything. I. That that other piece, that uh, animated one, has a really interesting idea where it's like that basic level of pixels, where they're all like it's your unit of measurement for your screen or whatever, and like 
that you address that in a different way where the pixels are not not of a standard size it's a really right. intriguing thing to watch like the the non standard size pixel mirror that you have yeah thanks um, yeah um so i don't know i uh, i'm always hesitant to ask people this it's like a magician to reveal their secrets but um i what what kind of platforms are you using for uh different coding things what like how did how did you generate uh like I, so far I've seen you. You've got an app <laughs> that interacts with uh, software that you have for driving the the piece that we saw at NASA, um, and you've got such apparently prowess over the visual realm, manipulating pixels in that way. What what kind of tools are you using these days? It, it really varies by project. Um, I'm happy to talk about it. I don't. I don't think it actually reveals much to talk okay. about the, the tools. Um, uh, it, it can be interesting to people interested in looking at what tools could they use. For me, I mean, a lot of my visual work, so the, the pixel-related work you're, you're talking about and a uh, recent piece of mine I put out called Computers Watching Movies, mm-hmm. um, that's, those are done in a language called Processing. Oh, yeah. Um, which you're probably familiar with. And that's just kind of a, a simplified Java made for artists and designers. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you know, when I can do something in processing, I'll do it there because it's often going to save me time in some way or another. Um, but it, that's not always something I can do. And um, the robot, the 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 heart of the robot code and the the AI code that that ran more like this is all written in Python. Okay. Um, and I use OSC to talk to Max MSP to do sound output and also to get sound input. Yeah. Um, I use JavaScript to do the the uh, interactive components online. They all talk to a an online. Um, it's really a cool system called Firebase that I'm really digging right now. Firebase dot com. It, it's essentially a. It's like takes all the things about databases that you don't want to do and it gets rid of them and makes them really easy to use. Okay. Um, nice. So it creates a. Um, an online space where any one web page can write data to the database, but then whenever that data changes, it notifies all the other web pages that are connected of the change. And so with that description, you can probably start to imagine how the little plus minus app might work. That's the thing that really intrigued me about it at first was how instantaneous it was. And that's that's why I got my phone out and shot that. that, that, I didn't say that video that I was showing earlier. I shot on my phone of me holding my phone in one hand and my tablet in the other hand doing that thing and i the reason i wanted to do that was to show these two guys actually how (laughs) fast it was it's amazing it's amazingly fast yeah and i mean i think that's one of the most i mean for me exactly how the the aesthetics of these interfaces work is really important and if it feels sluggish, if it feels like you aren't in control, it's you're not going to play with it. You're not going to use it. You're not going to have that same sense. And, right. and you know, that's in a large, I mean, that's, I'm using Firebase for that, and I'm really happy oh. with the level of performance. Now, that raises a question that I have, um, talking about interface design and the speed issue in particular has always been one that I've really kind of focused on, maybe to the exclusion of other elements. Um with the rapid advances in technology that you've seen since you started doing this, uh, what are your expectations for future tools that will be able to do more web-based collaborative works or that will just have more processing horsepower in a smaller package and be able to do more interesting things with live spectralization or uh, Fourier-based transformations? I mean, the truth is I want everything to get better <laughs> in all spaces um, because every time it does, it presents new options but also creates new constraints because as soon as something improves, you realize the new thing it can't do that it almost could do. Yep. And I feel like I always right at that edge of like I really wish it could do this thing if, even though it's doing all these other things I never thought it would do. But – I mean, the the general answer I'd give is is it's all about network. You know, it's all about um, latency and bandwidth. The less latency, the more bandwidth, the more um, 
opportunities I th- will be created for for anything that's interconnected. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, in this country, due to policy, we're we're really behind on a lot of that um, in terms of what we have available to us in general. Um, but eventually, presumably, somehow it'll all work out and um, we'll start really seeing some some dramatic improvements in those kinds of things. Hackers, hackers. And that around. actually segues perfectly into my next question <laughs> as well. Um, you have some very, very, very interesting uh, non-musical pieces on your site. Uh, the scare mail and the uh, Facebook demetricizer. Demetricator. Demetricator, sorry. Um, those are definitely not musical, but I think that they serve a very, uh, interesting function in society talking about, uh, how with the demetricator, we're always measuring ourselves. Uh, there are any number of articles you'll see or hear on NPR about, uh, the quantized or quantified or quantitated, whatever they call it nowadays, self. And using the Fitbit to track everything you do. Right. Uh, but at the same time, you have the NSA doing that exact same thing, and people are freaking out about it. Yes. So what prompted these works, and how do you see them fitting into this conversation of privacy and at the same time the desire to spew every little random bit of data that we have about ourselves onto the network? nowadays so yeah i mean with with facebook demetricator which you know just the the one sentence description is it takes all the quantifications on the facebook interface and it just hides them so it no longer says eight people like this it'll just say people like this for example i mean really the impetus for that piece is my own becoming aware of my own obsession with quantifications in facebook Mm -hmm. realizing that I'm looking more for how many likes I get than who liked it or for how many people shared my photo than, or how many comments are left than what they wrote. Right. And wanting to think about at an interface level and a code construction level, what's going on here? What are the mechanisms that lead me to start to pay more attention to numbers than less attention to context and, and, and who's at play in these systems? And, you know, so that so really for me, it started as an experiment. I want to see what happens if I remove the numbers for me. Mm. Um, of course, at the same time, I really wanted to be able to share that opportunity with others as an experiment and see um, what might change uh, given yeah. that. And as I did that, I started to research quantification and, and do all kinds of, of, of thinking about what might um what might be at play here, not just from an interface perspective, but from a theoretical perspective. Mm-hmm. And I'll put it in this terms, which is that, you know, capitalism is dependent upon growth. It's a, it's a fundamental component of a capitalist system working is that we continue to grow, we continue to make more, we continue to have more. And the key word here is more. Right. More is an unfulfillable need. You can never actually have more because more requires more, right? So, um, yeah, I've, I've done some writing about this, too. I'll, in fact, I'll give a talk. Uh, maybe I'll send you guys the link. It'll be live-streamed in a couple awesome. weeks in New York. Yeah. About, uh, detail. Yeah. This. But um, in general, I'm interested in, like, you know, when you have a system that kind of drives and plays on an inherent desire to have more, than, and it keeps showing you how much you have, then it the likely outcome is you're going to keep trying to produce more in that system. Right. Um, you know, in terms of scare mail, I mean, the moment that the first Snowden revelations came out last June, um, I mean, honestly, almost right away, I had the idea for scare mail. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I, you know, right away people are talking about encryption and we need to hide and, we're already doing that in a lot of ways. It's just that the yeah. NSA has back doors to what we do. And um, we think we have privacy and we think we're hiding. And it, it's, good. it's a constant cat and mouse game to mm-hmm. hide from the NSA. Um, right. And anybody else who wants to, to, get in, to get inside. So I started thinking about an alternative model. And you could, we can discuss whether or not it's viable or not. But the yeah. you know, model is privacy through visibility. 
you know, the more that you, you know, if we can flood the system with things that they're already looking for, then they'll never find anything because they're overwhelmed with too many options of things to, to look at. Right. Um, so I had the idea right away, but honestly, I was afraid to make it for a while. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I mean, I kind of sat on it. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't write it, and eventually there was a, there was a, um, uh, oh, a call for works related to Prism from iBeam, and I was like, okay, this at least if I released it in the context of of a show about works about Prism, it felt a little safer, I guess. So yeah, if they um, come so, knocking on your door, then you'll just be like, no, it was just for this thing. Like I, I don't know. know. Yeah, I don't know. Like you mean you somebody else to uses it? Yeah. You're right. <laughs> we would like to clarify to the NSA or anyone else who is watching this that uh, Mr. Grosser created that piece solely for that particular exhibit. It has nothing to do with any spying that may or may not be happening on American nothing. citizens or others in the world. Nothing at all. Yes. Exactly. Have you gotten a lot of uh, participation in Scaremail? You know, Scaremail gets less participation than Demetricator. Um, okay. Really? Yeah, you know, Demetricator is really popular. I mean, okay. really, in, in, for, from my perspective, it's really popular in that, I don't know, it has like anywhere from five to 10,000 people using it nice. these days. It's had a lot more tried over the you know, last couple of years. Scaremail, yeah. I would say, has a lot less because people are afraid to use it. I mean, it's fundamentally a tool to attract the NSA to your email. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, if I could flip a switch and everybody used it tomorrow, then we'd all be safe using it. And it would do its job, yeah. but I can't do that. And right. so, um, yeah, I don't get perfect metrics on on usage because I distribute it in different ways. But I'd estimate it's a couple thousand people using Scare Mail um, at once. Yeah, that's that's pretty wild. Well, now, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, yesterday, of course, we found out about Heartbleed which uh, is a massive, massive, massive uh, vulnerability affecting many very popular websites um, that you can find out more about with a quick Google. But basically, a lot of passwords have been compromised, account details, banking, uh, open SSL, among other things, which was previously thought to be decently secure. I mean, I'm not going to say the best, but decent. Yeah. Um, and people are finally realizing that what they put online is not as secure as they previously thought. So do you have any ideas to do work that's based off of that and the idea of perceived security or insecurity? Um, great question. I mean, I'm certainly thinking about it. I haven't come up with any grand ideas yet, but I think it, you know, what it does is it, presents in a new light something that, that really I think a lot of people who are more focused on these spaces have always realized, which is that these, these systems aren't secure even when you think they are. I mean, this is an example of it, but it's one of several examples over the last year that's, that's right. really been you know, heavily publicized. This one's maybe a little more intense in that it was a, it's, a, it's a bug and, and was being potentially exploited, but um, this is just one that somebody found, right? How many haven't been found or how many have been designed um, in these systems that, that were designed to not be found, you know, for example? Um, so I, yeah, to me, what's most interesting about it right now coming out at this point is that it's, it, it alerts people that even when you think these systems are secure, there's a chance that they're not. Because two days ago, we all thought, all these systems that were using OpenSSL were secure, and turns out they weren't. Yeah, I, I would add though that because it's open, this was caught, right? That's oh yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, if it were closed source, it would have been much harder to catch. That is that is very true. Yeah, good point. Interesting thing. Well, well, Ben, uh, what what do you like? I guess so. What's next for you? You just had this successful piece at NASA. What 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 are you working on next? Yeah, I'm catching my breath a little bit. Um, I mean, I've I've got uh, you know this conference theorizing the web in New York. Um, it's theorizing the web. You can just Google that and you can see it. Um, okay. uh, talking about Demetricator there, and then I'm 
going to the Electronic Literature Organization conference in June to talk about scare mail. Um, okay. And uh, after that, I've got a, I mean, I've got a lot of kind of a big list, and I'm not sure what's next on it. Um, yeah. You know, getting to the getting to more like this was uh, one of the. Well, you guys know this. It's, you know, it's all up to it, and then you get there, and then there's like a month <laughs> worth of stuff to catch up on that I blew off. So. Right. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yeah. We've all got that list of the pieces yeah. we'd love to write. The I mean books we want to read and everything you know yeah yeah well i look forward to hearing about how your talk goes and uh yeah for sure send us that link for the stream sure. um we'd love to i mean i'd love to tune in and we may plug it on the show too if we have our next one before you before you talk yeah um but i uh, so i think this brings us to uh our last segment of the show um, it does indeed nate yeah ben could you read me in <laughs> so, I, I can do that so, it is once again time for the infamous two-minute challenge. Up this month, we have Nate. And Nate, I believe you're discussing and explaining in two minutes or less the concept of open sound control. Yeah, OSC that our, our guest talked about a little bit. Um, well, I love OSC, so I see we have the counter up there. Yeah, and I'm I'm ready whenever you are. <laughs> You it. need one of those beep, beep, boop. <laughs> so, <laughs> so say you've got hardware talking to hardware or software talking to hardware. There's this open uh, or this, this protocol called MIDI that's really good at doing that talking. Say you need to talk software to software or one computer to another computer over the internet or like a software synth on one computer to drive an internet Arduino somewhere else. Um, there's this wonderful computer pro or communication protocol called Open Sound Control, or OSC for short. It was developed at the Center for New Music and Audio Technologies, or CMNA, CNMAT. C <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. But um, it's a University of California, Berkeley Department of Music. It's this wonderful protocol for um, doing the same kind of communication that would happen over MIDI, over uh, MIDI cable, but this can happen over the Internet or locally within your computer. It uses a URL-based system for naming. So, like, where, say, in MIDI, you would, like, send a message over port 2, use channel 5, and s s tell note number 55 to do what it does with a velocity of 82, and then send another message to turn it off. The language for uh, open sound control can be much more, like, re reader-friendly. You might put in the... Um, the ISP address, um, IP. IP address, thank you. Um, the IP address for the computer that you want to talk to, and you just say, like, that address slash cello slash loud slash C5. <laughs> and you, that, you could use something like that. It's a wonderful thing. It's super fast. Um, it can send bundles of messages instead of serial, uh, instead of one after another, like MIDI. Um, the latency is in terms of... Uh, I believe it's picoseconds instead of milliseconds, like um, in MIDI, and uh, so you can do really high precision things. And you, uh, the list of programs to talk to is hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I All think right. that's probably the best that's I've ever good. done. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> it's not bad. Not an easy you, challenge. Yeah, open sound control. It's, it's it was talk. much easier than the time Ben tried to do bit rate, I think. <laughs> sample rate. Or sample, sample rate, rather. See, that should yeah. be a different one. Right. Bit rate. That'd be even be... harder, maybe. Yeah, bit rate would be harder. Oh, God. I think so. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. Well, so there's open sound control. It's one of the tools that our, our, our guest, Ben Grosser, uses, um, and it's wonderful for many things. I. Uh, and Ben, thank you so much for uh, giving us some insight into the, the different kinds of pieces that you do. And uh, the different music and art and everything that you make. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, do you have any last plugs you'd like to make of things coming up? I know we kind of did this before. But... Um, no, you know, uh, nothing new. But I just want to say I really appreciate it. It was a great conversation. I had a really good time. And it's nice to see the show. I'll make sure I tune in from now on. It's good to see you guys doing this. Well, thanks. Thank um, you. Yeah, well, well, Ben, you, just like the rest of our viewers, uh, can view this as patch in. It's part of the soundnotion.tv network, and um, you, can, you can view <laughs> past episodes and get our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash pi, 
or you can uh, subscribe to us on iTunes or whatever uh, different pod catching uh, services that you use. Um, you can support our show through the Amazon link uh, that we have on the website or that we've got places where you can donate. And you can also check out our other shows, The Regular Sound Notion. Um, we've got Streamers and Punches is a wonderful thing and a bunch of other content on the site. Um, but yeah, my name's Nate Blyton, Ben Furman, and, uh, and thanks so much, Ben Grosser. And uh, that wraps up Patch In Episode 6. Thanks. We'll see you next month.